Along the banks of the Mississippi River in far southern Louisiana lies a forgotten chapter of history with a deep significance. Wow, look at that. That is super cool. Join me for an exploration of two now abandoned fortresses along America's most important river. Some places you visit just give off a feeling of isolation, as if you are traveling to the ends of the earth. This was certainly the feeling I had as I visited Plaquemines Parish in far south Louisiana. So far south that the area is being swallowed up by the Gulf of Mexico gradually. brings me to the far reaches of Louisiana, you might ask. It is here, towards the end of the mighty Mississippi River, that I learned of a chapter of nearly forgotten history, going back even before the United States existed as a country, to an area that has played a large role in early American history throughout several wars, including critical battles. There are two locations here that have seen so much history pass before them. From seeing the rise and fall of empires, and even being a different country at one time. Some stranger allegations of cult activity, among other things, have occurred in this area. This is the story of the now abandoned Fort St. Philip and its counterpart, Fort Jackson, right along the Mississippi River. Fort St. Philip and Fort Jackson are masonry fortifications located directly across from one another on opposing sides of the Mississippi River, about 80 miles south of New Orleans, in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana. Where they are located happens to be about 40 miles upriver from where the Mississippi empties into the Gulf of Mexico. Of the fortifications, Fort St. Philip is arguably the more historic of the two. This fort finds its beginnings at a time when Louisiana was controlled by the Spanish Empire. Originally called Fort San Felipe, it was ordered constructed by the Spanish governor of Louisiana in 1792, to be completed in 1795. The location was chosen in part due to the strategic bend in the Mississippi River in the area. The fort would not remain in Spanish control for very long, as in 1803 the French Empire would take control of Louisiana. Previously, France had controlled Louisiana for nearly a century, 
from the late 1600s up until 1762, when it was transferred to Spain as part of the fallout from the Seven Years' War. An interesting side note is that the area where Fort St. Philip is located is said to have been where the first ever Mardi Gras celebration was held in 1699 by French-Canadian explorer Pierre Lemoyne de Iberville, who was trying to find the mouth of the Mississippi at the time. Mardi Gras has become very well known around the world and is tied very closely with the cultural history of the state of Louisiana. So the significance of this area being tied to the original Mardi Gras has earned its name as Mardi Gras Point. With the French having acquired Louisiana back from the Spanish in 1803, it was a few months later that the Louisiana Purchase took place, where Napoleon Bonaparte sold most of France's North American possessions to the United States. This is where the history of Fort St. Philip begins to get even more interesting. During the War of 1812, between the British Empire and the fledgling young United States, Fort St. Philip would be the scene of an intense battle between British and American forces. Between January 9th and 18th of 1815, the British Royal Navy began to bombard the American garrison at Fort St. Philip. This attack more or less was an attempt to divert attention from the British attack on New Orleans itself, which was the culmination of their nearly five-month-long Gulf campaign, in which the British were attempting to capture various American territories along the Gulf of Mexico. Fort St. Philip protected the Mississippi entrance to New Orleans, which is one of the reasons why it was attacked. While the British had a different route to attack New Orleans simultaneously, it completely failed and the British lost the battle for New Orleans. The siege of Fort St. Philip subsequently ended with the British unable to pass the fort and head up river. The fort withstood the multi-day barrage from various cannons and weapons of the time. Only two American casualties were reported during the duration of the siege. While Fort St. Philip had withstood its first battle, during the presidency of Andrew Jackson, who had led the Americans into victory at the Battle of New Orleans, called for the construction of a second fortress across the river from Fort St. Philip. It was to be called Fort Jackson and would be started in 1822 and completed in 1832. Together, these two forts would serve as a formidable defense of not only the growing city of New Orleans, but the entrance to the Mississippi River, which is likely the most important river in the entire United States, especially for the development of the country and in the 1800s. The forts would not be tested in battle, however, until a few decades later. Fort St. Philip would again find itself trading hands from one power to another, alongside Fort Jackson this time. In 1861, Louisiana would become part of the Confederate States of America and would play a critical role in the American Civil War. New Orleans suddenly found itself as the largest city in the Confederacy, and given its strategic location, as well as its port, the Union was keen on trying to wrestle control of the city from the Confederacy. This led to the 10-day Battle of Forts Jackson and St. Philip in April of 1862. Prior to the battle, the Confederacy had assumed a likely Union attack on New Orleans would come from northwards. Thus, many crucial defenses of the city were moved up along the north side of the Mississippi. With that being said, Forts Jackson and St. Philip were essentially the main defense of New Orleans at that point. The battle began on April 18th and consisted of two phases, the first being a bombardment of the forts by the Union Naval Fleet under the command of David Farragut. This lasted for six days, with the firing off of thousands of shells daily. This diagram shows some of the damage Fort Jackson sustained. The bombardment was considered ineffective by most historians, as even after multiple days, the Confederates were able to continue sustaining fire on the Union fleet. The second phase of the battle began when Farragut decided they should try to pass the forts, which is what they ended up doing. 
The Confederates had placed a barrier chain across the Mississippi to block any ships from passing, but Farragut's forces were able to exploit a gap in the chain to sail past it, after which they were engaged by guns from the fortresses, which did very little damage to the overall fleet. The battle ensued with some Confederate naval forces, but overall it did not end well for the South, and most of their forces were sunk. With Forts Jackson and St. Philip defeated, as well as the Confederate naval forces, the Union proceeded to sail up to New Orleans nearly unopposed, and over the next few days they captured New Orleans, marking a turning point in the war, as well as a loss of the largest city for the Confederacy. Over 1,000 soldiers died during the Battle of Forts Jackson and St. Philip, with the Confederates losing 729 soldiers, while the Union lost only 229. This would be the largest and most deadly battle that these two forts would see. In the remaining years of the Civil War, Fort Jackson would be used as a prison by the Union. The decades following the end of the American Civil War were quiet for the two forts on the Mississippi. They would mostly sit idly by until they were modernized around the time of the Spanish-American War in 1898. Although the theaters of this conflict took place in the Pacific and the Caribbean, there was some concern of a Spanish attack perhaps on New Orleans and parts of Louisiana. So Forts Jackson and St. Philip would once again serve as a defense of the city and of the Mississippi River. While such an attack never happened, the fortresses remained in military use for some time, even into World War I as a training ground of sorts. The 1920s would see the end of government use of the two forts, and they would both fall into private hands after that. Fort Jackson was sold by the state of Louisiana to private owners in 1927, and that's where it would remain until 1960, where it was donated to Plaquemines Parish and designated a National Historic Landmark. It was in bad shape by this time and nearly abandoned, but a renovation process took place and it eventually became somewhat of a park open to visitors. Fort St. Philip, on the other hand, would have a more interesting fate. It too fell into private hands after World War I. While it was also designated a National Historic Marker in 1960, in 1964, during the Civil Rights era, it was converted into somewhat of a makeshift prison. In the 60s, we had a parish president Leander Perez, who was against segregation. So Martin Luther King was supposed to come down here in March, so he went and barbed wide the whole thing. And they had him on the national news saying if they came down here, they was gonna arrest them all and put them over there. And they asked, how many can you accommodate? He says, I don't care if they come by the tens of thousands, I'll pack them in here like cattle. Well. Martin Luther King went to Plaquemine, Louisiana, instead of here. So nobody ever got put over there. So it was then, just turned into a kind of a prison and just not used? Yeah. The fort remained in private hands, and in the late 1970s would become the home of what has been described as a cult, known as the Vela Ashby community. It was maybe two guys and the rest women, and the women were harder than the men. They made rafts and floated a tractor over the river. They brought a truck across the river and they kept it manicured better than I could keep this side cut. So what was this, what was this cult or this group of people? What was their deal? They just wanted to live. But they lived in the, in the ruins of the fort? And yeah. Some of the buildings. Yeah. They used to have some old houses over there and they fixed them up lived in them all and like i said they had their gardens they kept the grass cut you know kept to their cells they come up the, some of the women came on this side to work and then they'd go back when some people think of the word cult what usually comes to mind is some kind of dark and nefarious group involved in ritualistic sacrifice or some kind of dark arts the Vela Ashby group seemed far more benevolent, at least through my cursory research about them, their name being derived from the surnames of the owners of the area around Fort St. Philip, 
being Vela and Ashby. They seemed to be a group of non-sectarian hippie types who wanted to farm and live in this area without really bothering anybody else. They didn't seem to number more than 20 people and resided in the area around the fort and were mostly members of the Christos family. The, the man who was the head of it died, so they all dispersed. I guess he was the one that kept them all together. And kind of fell apart. Yeah. yeah. Wow. They had one, one, one lady had a little boy over there. He came to the museum a while back and talked to him for a while and all. So he's the last person to ever be born on that side of the river. During the making of this documentary, I was in touch with this person who was born into the Vela Ashby group, with hopes of interviewing them about the group itself and what it was like growing up by Fort St. Philip. Unfortunately, I was not able to do so. Since the time the Vela Ashby group left the fort in the late 1980s, it has remained privately owned and in a state of complete abandonment, almost resembling the ruins from an Indiana Jones movie as we can see with certain pictures taken in this area. A direct contrast to nearby Fort Jackson, which for a long time functioned as somewhat of a museum open to the public. Fort Jackson always had the advantage of being on the more accessible side of the Mississippi, connected via the road system, while Fort St. Philip was more remote and tough to get to. Given all of the history of these two forts, their near current abandonment, and how forgotten they are in the grand scheme of history, in my mind, they fit in the strange places category, which meant, of course, I would have to visit and explore these places. I'm gonna try that. That's pretty, it seems like it's pretty tight in there. I don't know if that's coming open. It was open. Uh-oh, that's the guard rooms? Yeah. There's a little jail in there too. So you think it's maybe, is this stuck on the wall here? It shouldn't be. When was the last time it was open? A couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago. Hopefully no one, the water hopefully somebody didn't lock themselves in there. Yeah. Have to come with a, Ham, big sledgehammer or something, and open it back. Yeah, I wonder if it's, it doesn't seem like it's stuck on the bottom. That's, yeah, that seems, it doesn't look like it wants to budge. <laughs> so the water was up up here very recently. You can see the, the slime was up yeah. there. If I don't come turn the pump on, because the, the automatic float broke. So that's, it's, it's all coming from the moat then? Yeah. Wow. And this is normally closed, of course, to the public. Yeah, right. We'd have to get it. We've had some ghost hunters come do movies here, and when we get over here, there's a long corridor, and they was filming, and a brick just fell. Oh. So we don't want people. Right. To it's. It's. I get it. You don't want somebody getting hurt. Wow, it's interesting. This one was closed, but you can see it coming around here. Before Katrina, we had a model of the fort in here. Oh, really? And Katrina just took it out. It. Wow. This, this was full of water for Katrina. How, how high up was the water, would you say? At the top. All, to the top of the bricks yeah. there? No kidding. Wow. And this is the interior. And like I said, the, they made every brick here. Then the thickest walls are 21 foot thick. And they would have made the brick, what, right in here in the center? Yeah. Or? Wow. And the, the, before the Civil War, before that war started here, they had an octagon shaped building three stories in the middle. No kidding. And when Farragut came, attacked the fort, that was one of the first things to that go. they shot down. 
So we're now in. This used to be the museum. And all the artifacts we have in the museum now was in here. were in here, okay. And we had to come and get them, soak them in a solution to stop the salt water from <laughs> eating them. Dan, do you know what this room was used for previously? No, just no. all I know is the museum. Right. They might have had a, the offices quarters or something right here. Because in the back they had a kitchen. And then each, each little wing has its own couple windows for the cannons and they had fire going in it. Hmm. Mind if I step in there? Go ahead. You can see, I mean, is that, is that water level, I'm assuming? Yeah. That line right there? Is that the water level over right there? But during Katrina, this would have been all this was water. all on the water. Wow. And then that's just the moat right out there. Yeah. I'm sure during the Civil War, they might have had a cannon sticking out Stick of that. Out Acoustics, yeah. Is that floor damage from a can? Or would that be more recent? More recent? That's not sure. Yeah, wow. Have a can right out there, and you got your boat. So we've got these little kind of tunnels spaced all around here. Are those. That's each point. The each points point. that are. The fort. And those would be defensive points then? Yeah. Okay. And would each point have a certain amount of cannons or yeah. had people manning it? Two or three it? cannons in each one. But most of the attacks, I'm assuming, would be coming from the river. From the river. So was there any points for well, infantry? And the, the south didn't have the money the north had, and we didn't have the foundry to build the cannons. So we didn't have a lot of cannons here, mm. so some might have been empty. Uh. But when the Farragut started, it was a 21-day barrage coming wow. in. And he landed south of the fort and brought a platoon or whatever in. So the commander of the fort went down to meet him to fight. When he was down there fighting, the crew he left here surrendered. <laughs> wow, so he had no idea what was going on. Yeah. And him and the head of the f naval fleet wasn't talking and they wouldn't help each other, so. Had a big rain yesterday. Yeah. And then That's cool. These are the tracks for the cannons. These right so here? You can move it side to yeah, side. Yeah, right, right. So each window would have had a cannon? Yeah. And then up top, you got cannon spaces too. Wow, look at that. That is super cool. How would they rotate the cannons? Did they have a... Well, you can see that metal piece sticking out. Yep. I guess it was mounted to that. And they had wheels back here. And they they slide it side slide to side. Up. How many people would it take? I don't know. A few of them. Of yeah, I was going to say it's probably not, not very light. and all put in new electricity and all 
then the next year another storm came and took it all out yeah and the parish didn't put insurance on it so fema says if you don't put insurance on something they won't fix it anymore oh man that's a bummer trying to get the national park to take it over right And then this, would, what would they use the rest of this space for? Just extra cannon? I think that might have been a fireplace for them and oh, wow. just storage for ammunition. Wow. Oh. A little chimney there. Is it sealed up? Oh yeah, it goes up. That's pretty cool. Yeah, real chimney. <laughs> After the it was Civil War, the last battle, both the forts saw, or technically the Spanish one. Well, uh, I don't think anything happened here for the Spanish. Right, there was no actual they, fighting, but they, they were they using had it. They had it manned. Okay. Did they think that the Spanish were maybe going to try to attack this area? Yeah, they. Needed to get to New Orleans, so. Interesting. Because yeah. New Orleans back then was like New York. And it was a big hub of commerce yeah. and trade, yeah. Well, especially with the Mississippi, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is some kind of ammunition depot. Mm -hmm. I should have brought my flashlight up. Wish I had. I didn't think of it. That's pretty cool. Twenty-four pound howitzers. Oh, look at all the lizards, little geckos. Yeah. It's a lot of them. Used as jails after 1862, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. So they just they basically intern people here. Yeah. They. I forget if he was a mayor, in New Orleans, or something was. They brought him down here as a wow. prisoner. Huh. Oh yeah, turn my light on. Sure, I can just turn the night vision on, I guess. Flashlight out after all. Wow. Oh, yeah, you can see the uh, tracks in here. This is the munition storage depot. They sealed it up? Until they built the Spanish-American Wall stuff. I see some of those. Yeah. I see some this of right here, this was, oh, this was closed off. This was like a jail. This was jail. a jail? Wow. For, uh, during the Civil War? Yeah. So when the Union took over, they just basically, the guys who were maybe even manning this fort, ended up in jail. Yeah. What a strange fate. This right here is the oven room. The oven room. They used to put their cannonballs in here and get them cherry red and shoot them at the ships. So, so they potentially would melt catch things? on fire. This is an oven, huh? Mm -hmm. The water is right here. So I can only imagine how hot it would have been in here. Yeah, huh? but they had a door here. Yeah, so they could get a little bit of air. Mm -hmm. So how would they transport? With them 
like is like ice tongs, but but giant yeah. with the cannonball, cannonball. and then just throw it right in there, and yeah. it wouldn't heat up the cannons to the point where it might cause damage. Or I, they, don't, I don't guess they had it. They just do quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they probably knew what they were doing. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> going to war and whatnot. In the bricks there. You kind of see some water underneath that. You can see the water, what the water did. Took a pin right here. Must have got an air pocket underneath there or something. Huh. Wow, and that just came up like that? Yeah. So this box too, this would be this is all this out fried. Green. Yeah. Oh. There's a good amount of lights in here. I mean, you had them at every sort of mm -hmm. interval. Yeah. So after he was just telling me that after Katrina, FEMA put up all these rails and everything. And what was the purpose of that? Just to kind of keep people from falling over. Keep people from falling over. Wow. They had old handrails. They cut them off and put these. So this would be the newest section of the fort yeah. then. Mm -hmm. Spanish American War, they trained here for World War One. I. I got pictures in the museum of these guns. And they would lay down, you'd load them, use that hydraulic engine to pick them up, and when it shot, it would sit it back down. All that recoil sends yeah. it back down. And then this section over here. They had a, like a elevator. They send up the shells for it and all. Hmm. Underneath was a, like a storage room for the ammunition. So this would be that storage room? Yeah. So these fortresses just had so much added on to it over time. I mean, yeah. it's hard to imagine what the original one looked like with everything that's been added. None of this was here. Yeah. And there's one more room I've never been in, but you could get into it from the moat if you get a boat in the moat. Really? Wow. How deep is the moat? A couple feet. A couple feet, yeah. You guys get a lot of snakes and stuff in here? Oh, yeah. Cottonmouths? Yeah. Yeah. So there was a period where this was a little bit of a tourist. Oh, yeah, up until Katrina. Wow. The parish kept a crew here to cut grass and it was open. And then after Katrina, just kind of. Yeah. Was it now not worth the upkeep or? Well, to upkeep would cost too much. Yeah. Because you now with the bricks. And the mortar getting out of them. Yeah. Every time that tree sways, it pulls at the bricks again, and that's when the ghost hunters was out in that tunnel, and that brick fell. <laughs> so they don't want people just walking through it anymore. Right, right. And uh, what is this little pillbox-looking thing over here? Yes, it was a gold shack or something for the. Oh. So this, he says, the kitchen. It was the kitchen. It was the kitchen. And then they turned it into a generator room. Does that have anything to do with it? That might have been the heat of uh, while they was for the Spanish American War. I'm sure they didn't have that for the Civil War. Right, right. A little more low tech than just kind of hanging there, huh? Yeah. Is the exterior here with the moat and multiple points, the outer wall, and then back into here. So 
So from there, come back out into the main courtyard here. little bunker that's right next to Fort Jackson. Looks like you can go in all these little little spaces in here. Not a lot going on. Now we come up here. We've got our good view Right on the Mississippi, there's the fort. Bayou Mardi Gras, so, and the first Mardi Gras, 1699. Right there, Fort St. Philip. Apparently it goes quite a ways. So hopefully we'll be in that location checking that out. This would've been where a gun would've been. So it's really interesting to me, standing here by this historic fortress this area between Fort Jackson and Fort St. Philip across the river here. Two of the most historic forts in the US. The Spanish being the first to build that fort, then the first Mardi Gras, then you have it being used in the War of 1812, then in the Civil War, Spanish-American War, then during the Civil Rights era being used as an internment camp, and then where a cult lived, and now it's just abandoned. That just to me is wild. Even seeing Fort Jackson in the unfortunate state that it's in is it's a piece of history that's kind of being forgotten that's why i chose to come to this area and highlight this region because of you know kind of the loss of that history so i just find it really fascinating that you have an area like this that's such a crucial part of american history that's basically unknown i didn't know about this until a few weeks before i came here and started doing research something to add real quick to the previous statement i made about the significance of this area historically of course that we're on the Mississippi, this being one of the most historically significant rivers in the United States as a point of commerce. And we've got a giant boat coming by as we speak, giant barge, still to this day, crucially significant to the US. And we're standing now between two points, these two historic forts, and uh, to this day, 21st century, still being very heavily used as a transportation hub to the Gulf of Mexico, which is down that way. of Fort Jackson. The fort is right there. And I noticed all along here, along these rows, there's these little bunkers. You can kind of see them. You can see the top of the bunker here. It's super windy. So there's all, this whole row has bunkers. Wanted to go in and check this out. Wow. Whoa. Kind of creepy. Here's a little bunker. Some lizards up in here. See the lizards, assuming gathering there for warmth. You can see them running around in here. There's another one. A lot of glass on the floor in here. Coming out the exit of this. That's what you have in there. Don't know what these would have been used for. Store things. I mean, you got the rest of the fort over there. Kind of got a full picnic area over here. You've got what looks like another one right here. I don't know 
if they're all the same or this one's got a this one seems a little bit easier to walk into bunch of trash unfortunately same exact thing in here assuming they're all all along here it's the same kind of thing How cool is this with the way the tree has grown around the bunker? Same thing in here, I'm assuming. I hope I don't run into somebody in here. That would be really creepy. Graffiti, of course. <coughs> Who knows how old these types of bunkers are. It's a shame that they're in such poor shape and being basically abused. What a beautiful area with the oak trees and the Spanish moss overhanging. So there's one, two, three. This is number four over here. Hornet's nest. Hopefully not active anymore. But all right. Here's another one. Woo! Yeah, I wonder what they used to store in here back in the day. All right, and then here's number five. You can see they're all pretty much the same. So you've got some part of the, the rivers that way, the Mississippi. One, two, three, four, five. Bunkers all lined up here. So this is the top side of one of those bunkers. So you've got the five going this way, the rest of the fortress there, and there's this foundations of a bridge or some kind of a rail that they would have used maybe to transport materials through the water. I don't know. I don't know how old it is or when it's from, but still here, like much of the fortress. Looks like the hill here has reclaimed what's left of the metal of another turret or a gun right here. I don't know if this, this entire tree may have grown in the spot where this gun was, but you can just see barely where it would have been. Maybe World War I or Spanish-American War. Hopefully you can hear me over the wind, but this is another section of the fortress. This is what I'm assuming would have been some kind of rotating gun, cannon of some sort, probably Spanish-American War period. And then you've got the actual fortress itself down here. Another one of those bunkers. walls here along with this bunker. Check this out. So it's a really windy day but I was told that there are alligators in the moat here so for what it's worth there are gators. Another bunker here. Grab the flashlight. This one looks like it's been used as maybe a latrine. This is a really tight crouch in here. Oh, it does not smell good in there. I'm not going any further. That's nasty. They all kind of look the same anyway. Man, what an absolute shame. You have such a historic location that's basically being used for graffiti and as a latrine within 
few feet of the actual fortress itself. Just a bummer. People really, really suck. And I get that nothing lasts forever and this place will all be gone at some point, but it's a shame that something so historic is treated so poorly by just people. That's just a, it's an unfortunate factor, an unfortunate reality. So here we've got some some cracks from what I was told is that the trees were not here originally. Can't only imagine what it looked like without the tree cover, but the trees all came in and they've been damaging the walls because you can imagine this, this is a massive tree right here. And imagine the root system that's in there. So this is an old entrance. It's no longer really in use much. Doesn't look too good. And we got the walls of the fortress right around here. You can see into there, one of the old portholes. And we've got this guy here, broken gate. It is blocked off, so we would not be able to get in there. This whole section of the fortress is basically blocked off. Interesting. Another example of the trees. Look at these roots going all in there and it's destroying all what's inside. From what I understand, these railings, this stuff was all put in by FEMA after Hurricane Katrina. So this would have been basically an alternative entrance to the fort, but it's basically abandoned now. You can see this entrance, not really in very good use, I should say. So you imagine if we were to kind of walk through the other side is the main entrance if you went to with Mark, but you come up here. You get over here. And you've got a wonderful view of this side of the fortress. But unfortunately, I guess nature had a different plan. As you can see, things aren't going too well. I mean, I imagine Fort St. Philip, probably the same way, but even worse shape because you don't have people going there as regularly. We, we couldn't get access to go, unfortunately. Let's see, there's four wheeler tracks. A lot of fun to come through here. And imagine being able to ride around. Not supposed to, but people still do it. But you're riding around centuries of history. So this looks like it would have been another walled section. It's been destroyed. A picnic sites in here. So when I was in the actual fort with Mark, we were in that section. We came out of over there. And you can see the chimneys there. That was the kitchen area, at least that we think. Cool to see it from the other side, and you can see it's separated by the moat, of course. Hanging out here by the ruins. Hard to imagine how many people lived and died, not only building these forts, but dying in battle, whether it was the, you know, the, the Civil War, the War of 1812, just how many people died in this region, lived here. I mean, this was their, this was their home. They put so much time and effort into constructing this fort, and then Fort St. Philip on the other side centuries worth of blood spilled right in this area. After seeing Fort Jackson inside and out, my next goal was to lay eyes on Fort St. Philip itself, as opposed to Fort Jackson, which you can drive right up to in order to visit. Fort St. Philip is across the Mississippi, meaning it is only accessible by boat. For this task, I called upon local Captain Richie Blink of Delta Discovery Tours, 
who offers a glimpse into this unique Mississippi River Delta environment in an up-close and personal way with his tours. With Richie's help, we would be able to visit the area around Fort St. Philip in this more remote section of the Mississippi. We're now on the Mississippi. St. Philip. Yeah, so what's going on? This is the old remnant levee. Um, and on top of the old remnant levee, there would have been an old road that went down to Fort St. Philip, and that's how folks could access the site. Um, at the time, some of the smaller distributaries on this side either naturally closed up or were closed up by the humans. Um, and this was one of the ways to access the area. On so, would that have been the Spanish then who originated, or, or was this road later? Oh, I think this road was much later. Than okay, the yeah. But so you said enslaved persons made this? Most likely Most during likely. that time frame. Yeah. That's kind of how that stuff went. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately. So it hasn't been maintained in a long time, clearly. The last, uh, the last I was able to tell was maybe about the 1920s from some documents I was able to find. These are basically wild cows just left over and sort of just do their own thing. They are local wildlife in a way now. So, so maybe about 250 yards or so from where we're currently at is the, the, the ring levee that surrounded Fort, Fort St. Philip. And Fort St. Philip was then really a large area, right? Yeah, I would describe it as like a half mile long military complex from you know mostly the 19th century. Wow. But I mean, it was occupied from uh, from probably the 1770s. So all the way up until the 1980s in one way or another. Right, so that's that's a that's a longevity that Absolutely. so the, the the abandonment has really only been I mean the last what 40 50 years in a way. Yeah, there was a you know a commune or an intentional community that was here in the 1980s um, called Bella Ashby named after the two landowners at the time, the Bella family and the Ashby family. And those folks were here, I believe, uh, 9 years or 11 years or so. They were, you know, they're uh, the sort of leader they had, uh, a guy named by, uh, a guy by the name of Case Bolt, and uh, he, he referred to himself as Arcana Christio, sort of like the anointed one, right? Um, you know, it seemed like just time worked its way through, and, and you know, that, that sort of ended. But uh, it, this place has a lot of layers of history that are really reflective of American history in general. I mean, I really feel good. No, no, I was just going to say, I, I just find that so fascinating because, like you just alluded to, I mean, that's hundreds of years of continual use in one way or another. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, now, you know, nature's taking it back, and that's, you know, it's it's very telling in just another chapter, right? Yeah, it's another layer. Yeah, whether that's... Uh, the last layer, perhaps? Yeah, Who knows? Neglect or bureaucracy or some combination thereof that um, has made it... Um, 
you know, difficult for, you know, to maintain places like this. Right. But it's hard, you know. I mean, this this place used to have uh, city power and such. It had a water treatment plant. Um, there were many, many layers to it. And, and at the time that they were there, there were several large wooden houses that would look like, you know, an older house in any town in the U.S. Oh, not much left, huh? No. And once we get up ahead a little bit, we'll probably be able to see some... Uh, some ramparts and such. If um, kind of look in the towards the back over here, you can see uh, some people call it the smokestack, but I believe it was the uh, the center of a, a siding mechanism. It's it's a, a darker structure, kind of way in the horizon back there. What's going on? That, that was much higher, maybe as much as like 20 feet above the water line. And you can see today, you know, that might be six or eight feet above the water line. That might be a little generous. And is that, so that would be is that the structure that's from the. Is the most recently added on one? No, oh, oh, it's like the oldest, right? Oh, that's and the so, oldest. So okay. the sinking uh, is pretty stable here, and what's going on is, uh, you know, each one of these structures is, is, is sinking at the same pace almost, and the foundational structure, right, is pretty interesting where these guys would cut willow and lay them end to end and make these, like, woven willow mattresses, and they would take oyster shells from the wild reef here, and they would sit there and pound on them uh, and create an oyster shell uh, concrete called uh, Coquette or Coquina. Mm. And and what's going on is uh, then they would start laying bricks on top of that or, or cement, that kind of thing. And so these uh, these structures are almost like floating on the soft soil here. Wow. But, you know, it's the geology here is tough, right? This is some of the newest land in North America. Um, in one of the Civil War era nautical charts, which was, you know, two generations or three human generations after the original fort was built, What's going on is there's a, a, a map or, or a, 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 a point of interest a little bit downstream of here, and it was called the Lone Tree. So there weren't this this landscape this landscape couldn't even support trees. It was such a marshy um, sort of delta uh, soil here, right? That was that was more more liquid than land. Yeah. Wow. And that's so that's this is basically the site of the original Spanish fort, then, right? Yeah, the Spanish had like a earth and mace, uh, an earth and timber fort here, and it didn't seem like they were here very long. And then the French got the place, and then the Americans ended up with it. Um, and it, it saw, you know, many uses during its time. A lot of changing of the hands. Absolutely. So that right there, Fort Jackson. So it would have been there, and then this is Fort St. Philip. So you can see two sides of the river. I'll launch the drone up here and get some some shots. We, we can't go into Fort St. Philip and uh, it's private property. Really important to emphasize that people should not go there. Uh, but we're just going to kind of film it from the air. Safe way to do it. Not have to worry about any any dangers that might be out there. I think that's probably the best best way to go about it. were damaged most likely during battle and so repairs were made where the, uh, the walls were re repaired with oyster shells right and that's sort of oyster shell concrete style i'm just saying this is even cooler than i imagined from the air it's really cool to get out there i thought we weren't going to see much because of the tree cover but this is a good time of year to check it out too i recommend only uh, january and february uh, to visit with of course the landowners sure sure, right? sure yeah um, it can get kind of snaky uh, <laughs> the rest of the year. Yeah, it really gives you a sense of the scale here. It's big. I would say. I mean, it takes a good three hours to really, really, really soak it in. Just hike back around it. Yeah. See some cows in there. 
Oh, I believe it. Yeah, that's fun. There's a lot of cows in the fortress. They don't need permission to be in there. <laughs> it's kind of a little... Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is the water treatment plant. Right, and this would have been a generator house. But mm. it's hard to say if that was Spanish-American War era or right. um, World War One. Imagine how many people who lived here, died here even. Oh, there's a couple cemeteries in there that seem to be, you know, lost to time and history. Yeah. See how cool that is being able to zoom in on it, how far away we are from it. All right, so here's a little shot for you with the drone. On this side, right now I'm zooming in on the remnants of Fort St. Philip. And then right across the river as I'm panning with the drone, right there is Fort Jackson. So that's what I would have been in extensively the past few days. So you can see this very spot in the river that we're in was the site of various battles, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I mean, this was really just a huge, huge area in history right here, the spot we're basically in. I just find that really cool. Maybe I'm just a history nerd. than I even thought just looking at it. I mean, I've been doing research on it since I learned about it. I didn't know that there was all that old masonry like at Fort Jackson still intact. I thought it was a lot more ramshackled and kind of destroyed. So that's really neat to see that. So there you have it, Fort Jackson, just right behind the levee there. Cool to now be looking at Fort Jackson again after seeing Fort St. Philip from the air. Comparison, the distance, of course, there to here, all the historic battles, everything that's taken place here. Definitely, I would say, a forgotten piece of American history, but also just history in general. Uh, this goes beyond, well beyond just America. I mean, this was obviously created before the U.S. was a thing, so all part of Spain and France at one point. So awesome, man, that was that was really great getting out there. I really appreciate you taking me out on the water. If people have an interest in getting out in this part of the Mississippi here in Louisiana, um, where can they find you at or how can they go about that? Sure, so while we don't bring people to Fort St. Philip because it's private property, yeah. um, we do bring people all around the Delta for a number of different things, right? Um, I can be found on Instagram, it's uh, Delta underscore uh, Discovery underscore Tours or uh, Delta Discovery Tours dot com. Um, and yeah, I would awesome. love to get you out. Birders, adventure seekers, people, pilgrims looking to get down to the end of the river. Yeah, it's really something to see in its entirety. Awesome. Thanks. I appreciate it. While it would have been quite the experience to explore Fort St. Philip on the ground, it was still cool to see such a historic place from above. Having now explored much of this area, I feel as if I have a better understanding of the multi-layered and complicated history this particular part of Louisiana has. It seems like oftentimes when we think about history, it is regarding a specific event, say a famous battle or an incident that took place at one point in time. As Forts Jackson and St. Philip have shown me, it is not those specific events alone that define a place, but the broader picture, no matter how unusual that history may be. These two locations offer us not necessarily a glimpse into the past, but a visual representation of those layers of history and how they have compounded over time and continue to affect one another. It makes me wonder what this place will look like in a few hundred years, or if it will even still be here at all, given how much this part of Louisiana has been disappearing into the Gulf of Mexico as is.